Welcome to NWA Connie Corso's podcast, where we talk all things dogs. Hey, Jimmy, how did you get started in the field of dog show judging and what inspired you to pursue it as a career? Well, the um, breeding um, and showing Corso's came before judging. You know, I, um, you know, I started um, breeding Corsos over 20 years ago and showing them. Uh, of course, at that time, we were in the rare breed circuit. We weren't in AKC yet. So um, as we progressed through that, uh, in 2008, I, I founded uh, Sashi Society of America County Corso Italiano, the National Breed Club, um, which put the breed into UKC with full UKC recognition in 2008. And that helped um, helped advance the, the breed into AKC, and, and, and the breed became AKC recognized in 2010. Uh, when that happened, the AKC um, would accept what they call a judge application of the adjunct program, which if you had um, 12 plus years of experience with the breed, uh, produced champions, of course, it couldn't be AKC champions, but either UKC champions or rare breed champions, uh, produce a certain number of litters, what have you, pretty much a criteria that's similar to becoming a judge under the regular uh, application, then you could uh, apply to become an AKC judge, which I felt was very important for our breed. And at that time, only myself and one other person applied uh, to become an, uh, an AKC breeder judge. Gotcha. Okay. Could you give us a brief history on the Connie Corso? Well, I can uh, keep as brief as possible. I mean, basically, uh, today's Connie Corso is the, the closest modern day breed uh, to the ancient Roman war dogs of ancient Roman molossers. Um, some would call them Canis Punas um, and what have you, depending on, um, you know, depending on who you speak with and, and what you research. But uh, when I was the judge's education director for AKC, I would always say that the the county Corso is the closest modern day breed to the ancient Roman war dogs, and many breeds trace their roots back to the Roman dogs. If you study other breeds, whether it's Rottweilers or Boxers or what have you, any Mastiff type dogs, most of them will uh, actually mention, uh, you know, their heritage or their roots going all the way back to the dogs of Rome. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, the closest modern day breed, like I said, it's the Connie Corso. The next closest would probably be the Neapolitan Mastiff, although Neapolitan Mastiff um, varies um, from what you would have seen back then and even what you would have seen as far as the Neapolitan Mastiff uh, uh, even 50 or 100 years ago. You know, uh, Of course, the Neapolitan Mastiff and the Connie Corso are the two, um, uh, the two Mastiff type breeds uh, recognized by the Italian Kennel Club. All right. I mean, basically, after the, the Roman days, you know, centuries passed um, and the uh, those dogs became um, uh, those dogs became rural Italian farm dogs. The Italian farmers, you know, used the dogs that could trace their roots back to the uh, to the Roman dogs uh, for whatever they needed to do on the farm, whether it was herding or hunting, catching and holding livestock or catching and holding um, wild boar on a hunt. You know, whatever, whatever the real Italian farmers would need, uh, those dogs did. And I say those dogs, um, those dogs were, uh, they weren't a recognized breed yet, obviously. Um, and those dogs um, were Neapolitan Mastiffs, were uh, Connie Depressas, were Connie Corsas. They all shared the same name and same characteristics, depending on the area or the region. Uh, we go back 100 years on Italian farms, your Neapolitan Mastiff or Mastino could be my Connie Corso. My Connie Corso could be the guy down the road's kind of So they all kind of shared the same names. As a matter of fact, when the uh, Neapolitan Mastiff was recognized as an official Italian breed in 1952, the original Italian standard um, said Mastino Napolitano, then had two surnames underneath that, Connie Corso, Connie Depressa. Uh, later on in the 60s, Connie Corso and Connie Depressa would be removed um, as surnames from the uh, Neapolitan Mastiff standard. So all those dogs are interrelated. Uh, both modern day breeds in Neapolitan Mastiff, which has become quite exaggerated as far as wrinkle and bone and substance, uh, and the Connie Corso, uh, both of those, those breeds can trace their roots back to the same similar type of dogs that you could find on the Italian farm, say, you know, 100 years ago. 
All right. Um, can you uh, elaborate on the correct head type, including the desired proportions, skull shape, and expression in the Connie Corso? So, the, of course, what separates any breed from another breed, the most distinct thing is the headpiece. That's typically what's, what's most different um, uh, in, in breed to breed to breed. And the Connie Corso's head is, is rather unique. Um, one of the key aspects of a Connie Corso's head uh, will be converging planes of the skull and muzzle. So basically, the, you know, the muzzle, if it's held horizontally, uh, horizontal, which any type you're, anytime you're talking about um, a dog and, and angles and what have you, everything's based on that imaginary horizontal line. So the muzzle is held horizontally. Uh, the skull will be slightly convergent. Uh, it won't be parallel. This will be called parallel planes where the top of the skull and the top of the muzzle are parallel. The planes never meet. Uh, the county course will slightly convergent. It should never be extreme convergence, um, which you'll see in more brachycephalic breeds um, like a boxer, a bull mastiff, um, of course, any of your bulldogs, the convergence is extreme. Okay. Uh, it should never be extreme. It should be slight convergence, but it should be obvious. When you look at a Connie Corso said, you should absolutely be able to see the convergence. You have to look for it. You have to look for it. It's probably not there or it's not, not adequate. Uh, and again, it should never be extreme. So the other key element of, um, uh, of a Connie Corso's head is the, is the muzzle. The muzzle's large, although it's relatively short. It should be one third uh, the overall length of the head, maybe just slightly longer. It should never be shorter. Again, if it gets shorter, we start getting into what we call the hypertype dogs. Um, the uh, the muzzle should be as wide as it is long, and it should be deeper than it is long. Um, so it should have a very very broad, um, very very prominent muzzle. The uh, other key aspect of the muzzle when you look at it is that um, it should never be recessive or pushed back. Um, as you'll see in, in again, breeds that have, have heavy brachycephalic characteristics. Uh, what I mean by that is if this is the top of the muzzle and this is the face of the muzzle, there should be a 90 degree angle there. It should never tilt back like this. Okay, so the front of the muzzle should be perfectly vertical. Uh, when compared to the horizontal line or the horizontal plane at the top of the muzzle. So those are a couple key aspects that you'd see immediately when you when you look at the head. The other aspect of the head overall is it should be large. It should be proportionally large in compared to the body. Um, the AKC standard uh, says approximately one third the height of the withers should be the head. Um, unfortunately, approximately can be either side. It should always be to the larger side. Uh, the Italian standards always said 36%, which is obviously more than a third what the AKC standard says. And that is a problem that I'm seeing um, with a lot of dogs, a lot of courses nowadays, is that uh, they have really big bodies, um, a lot of leg, a lot of, a lot of height, um, even a lot of substance, a lot of bone, a lot of muscle, but the head's small in comparison to the body. And it should be the other way around. The head should be proportionally large. You know, the head should be noticeably large on a Connie Corso. Uh, in comparison uh, to the body. So uh, you also asked about expression. So expression is when um, not only the correct proportions of the head are there, but when all the details, the breed specific details are there and obvious. Uh, that's expression. Expression isn't when you bait the dog up or the dog's alerted or what have you. Well, that can help with the appearance or help put the expression out per se. But the expression is when all those breed specific characteristics are, are obvious and they're there. The dog has a great expression as in a great breed expression. It expresses the breed specific characteristics. So some of the details um, that you wanna see when you, when you look at a Connie Corso's head, um, some of the other details of course is the, um, is, is the eyes. They play a key role in correct breed expression. The eye shape on a Connie Corso um, should be almond shaped to oval. Um, there's basically four types of eye shape terminology used uh, in the dog world. Um, one is, um, of course, round, like a bulldog. Uh, the other one is, um, is oval. Uh, the other one is almond. 
And the uh, the last one's triangle. Uh, triangle eye shape is more for your northern breeds, your Sammies, uh, your Huskies, um, uh, breeds of that nature. Uh, so the Connie Corso's eyes should be almond um, to oval. The AKC standard says almond. It also says almond for a Doberman, for example. Um, although the the eye shape of a uh, Corso is you know different than that of a, of a Doberman. So I like to say almond to oval is the shape. Also, the eyes should be um, spaced far apart in a subfrontal position. And what that means is the eyes aren't directly on the front of the skull if you're looking at the dog. And they're certainly not off to the side of the dog like on a sighthound. They're subfrontal. So they're mostly in the front, but they should be a little bit to the side um, as far as the placement, wide spaced and subfrontal position. Uh, the other aspect is they should be set just slightly above the muzzle point. So the eyes should never be set below the muzzle plane. So you should have the muzzle plane and the eyes just slightly a, above that. Uh, that's, that's a key part of expression is the eye shape uh, and placement. Um, so that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, another aspect of details in the Connie Corso head is that um, everything should be, should be uh, chiseled and squared, no rounding. Um, bulldogs, bull masters have a lot of rounding to the skull. Uh, a Connie Corso should be like it's chiseled out of granite. The muzzle, um, the uh, the skull, top of the skull should be flat, um, uh, flat between the ears and flat from looking from the side in profile. It should be flat. It should never be any curvature to it or any rounding to it, as you see in some other breeds. Uh, another um, Key aspect when you're looking right at the county course or at the expression, the breed expression, is that the uh, the muzzle actually forms a, a trapezoid. A lot of people will say county corso's muzzle is square. Well, it's it's square in appearance per se, but if you're looking straight at that muzzle, it should form a trapezoid. And a trapezoid um, would the trapezoid that it should form would be wider at the bottom than the top. So both of the sides of the muzzle should be uh, should not be parallel you know, they should be wider at the bottom than they are at the top okay um, if they're they're parallel then that's not a correct muzzle okay so it, that should form a trapezoid um, we're looking straight at it also nose should be large and also should be wide open it's a working breed uh, should be able to breathe freely um, so that's uh those are key points of uh of breed expression uh, and one of the things that you'll find um, that you're not going to see, um, unless you, of course, open the mouth and check the bite, or what I like to say better, the dentition, um, uh, because dentition follows muzzle configuration. Uh, we're pretty, um, uh, the AKC standard will allow uh, anywhere from a scissor bite to a slight undershot bite. And that's a, that's a broad range. Not many other breeds, you know, will accept all of that as being correct. Okay, so um, the, the typical dentition that will come um, with correct expression, correct muzzle configuration, because dentition is a byproduct of muzzle configuration, dentition follows muzzle configuration. So the correct dentition that you will find uh, is, is beyond just bite or closure. Um, it will typically be um, a slight undershot bite um, where the, the lower incisors are just uh, in front of the upper incisors. Um, they can touch, which, which is called a reverse scissor, or they can have a slight spacing, but again, nothing extreme, you know, no, no heavy brachycephalic extreme undershot bite. Um, the other aspect of it is the incisors, when you look at them, when you open the mouth, uh, the upper and lower incisors should be a straight line between the canines. Uh, typically, you'll find that in the lower jaw on almost all the dogs, where the variance will, will come, will be... Um, uh, the upper incisor between the canines will have some curvature to them. And, uh, and I can typically know what the tension is going to be like on a lot of dogs before I even open the mouth because of the muzzle configuration. Uh, again, the dentition uh, follows muzzle configuration. Another uh, important aspect of the dentition is uh, we talked about the trapezoid. And part of that trapezoid, uh, what goes hand in hand with the trapezoid, is the aspect of when you're looking right into uh, into the dog, looking eye to eye, you're looking into the dentition, the lower uh, canines will be divergent and the upper canines will be divergent on a correct dog, correct muzzle configuration. 
Uh, and again, where you'll see the most variance will be uh, in the uh, upper canines. A lot of dogs whose muzzle seems narrow or snipey to a degree, uh, when you open the mouth, you'll find that the upper canines are actually parallel. Sometimes even the lower canines are parallel also. They don't have the divergence. So the, the lower canine should be divergent. That means pointing slightly outward. And the upper canines likewise should be divergent, uh, pointing slightly outward. And all that working together is what gives you that trapezoid uh, when you look at the dog. So those are some, uh, some of the details of, um, of correct expression. Another detail of correct expression that's not mentioned in the standard, um, and it's very important actually uh, for the Condi Corso, is the masseter region or the muscles right underneath the eyes or underneath the cheekbones. The Condi Corso being a um, grip and hold dog or a catch dog, of course the jaw, the power of the jaw is very important. And the muscles that articulate the jaw that are responsible for that power or the ability to to grip and hold are the masseter muscles and the temporal muscles. Those are the two muscles that actuate that jaw and, uh, and are responsible for the power or the ability for it to hold or the strength of those muscles. So the masseter muscles are a lot of times I'll see where they're very shallow. Um, in, uh, in the dog world, the dog judging or what have you, um, common terminology would be, um, uh, would be a lack of fill or does the dog have adequate fill? Uh, another terminology, like on a bulldog, or, or if the masseter is extremely obvious or extremely developed, like again, like on bulldogs, um, we call that cheeky. Dog's very cheeky. So a county corso shouldn't be cheeky. Um, they shouldn't be extremely protruding, you know, be, be um, outside of the head frame, but they should have adequate masseter muscles. You use some fill, some definite fill, uh, underneath the uh, underneath the cheekbones, so that's another another key aspect of uh, uh, of a detail of correct expression in the corso. How do you assess the overall balance and proportion of a cunning corso's body, and what are the key elements you pay attention to? So, uh, on the body, as far as proportion, um, there's three um, basic categories for proportion of a body uh, in, in a dog. Um, one, uh, one would be called square, where the height of the withers, um, the length of the body is equal to the height of the withers. Um, uh, example of that is the Great Dane is a square breed, the Doberman is a square breed, um, the Boxer is a square breed. Um, their their length, of, length of body is equal to their height of withers. Um, then we have what we call off square breeds. An um, example, an off-square breed uh, would be a Rottweiler, where the length of body is just slightly more um, than the uh, the height of the withers. Uh, then we have uh, rectangular breeds. Uh, the County Corso is a rectangular breed. Uh, it should be 10% longer uh, in body than it is at height of the withers, and that's measured from the point of the shoulder uh, to the point of buttock. Um, Comparison would be some herding breeds, say the German Shepherds, an extremely rectangular breed where it's 15% point of shoulder to point of buttock. So as far as proportion, when I look at a county Corso, the first thing I want to see uh, is, uh, is a noticeably rectangular breed. Uh, not extremely rectangular, like a German Shepherd, but noticeably rectangular. If I had to sit there and look at the dog to figure out if, it's, if it is, you know, 10% longer than it is at the width, it probably isn't. That's probably off square. So it should be a rectangular breed, and rectangular breeds are more typical uh, of herding breeds or breeds that have to transverse um, a lot of a lot of ground and do it efficiently. Um, you know, they uh, a rectangular breed can cover more ground more efficiently uh, than a uh, than a square breed. Uh, although a square breed can be a little bit quicker uh, and, and what have you, uh, depending on what type of work it's is being asked to do. Uh, but uh, but uh, Connie Corso's body proportions should, should be noticeably rectangular. It's a rectangular breed. So uh, the other thing I want to look for from there, after I have a rectangular dog, is the um, is the point of elbow, or the elbow should be exactly one half the height of the dog or the withers. Okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, Corsos that have short upper arms. When that happens, in the the point of elbow. Um, kind of comes up in the body. Um, also, the depth of chest should be equal with that point of elbow. So that's real easy to see. Um, 
And if that's not right, you know, it's usually because the, the upper arm is short. So those are those are some important uh, some important proportions. The other one is that the neck um, should be approximately one third the height of the withers. And you know, we do have some corsos that have short necks, and uh, believe it or not, that actually affects the front assembly and the ability for the dog to uh, to be able to move properly. So so those are some of the proportions in the body um, you know that, that we look for. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, how important is overall structure and movement in the breed? What what aspects do you pay particular attention to when you're assessing a dog's movement? So, um, structure and movement go go hand in hand. Um, you know, in order for a dog to have good movement, it's going to have have to have good con construction, good structure. Uh, so, it's very important in the Connie Corso, um, as we know all the historical tasks, um, whether it was herding or hunting or hog catching uh, or what have you, um, all that needed to be a very sound, very sound structured dog that wouldn't break down. Uh, a lot of the Italian farmers, um, dogs that were working on the farm as far as uh, herding and, and what have you, uh, would go out on a hunt at night, you know, pull badgers out of holes and, uh, you know, hunt hog and catch hog and, and what have you. So that would be a very sound, solid, strong dog. Um, so as far as the structure, um, there's, there's nothing breed specific about structure on a Connie Corso. Um, it's the same sound structure that you would like to see in a lot of working breeds or herding breeds or even sporting breeds, the same basics apply. So we'll, um, you know, we'll start with the, um, with the back line. Uh, the back line um, is basically um, the spine. A lot of people confuse back line with top line, but it's two different things. Uh, the back line starts at the point of withers and stops at the buttock. The top line will include the neck uh, and the tail, actually. So the back line is where we're going to look at first on the dog. It should be, uh, it should be straight. Okay. Also, the Connie Corso um, top line should be level. should never be rampant. So we want a nice, strong, sound uh, back line or spine. Uh, and then a nice level uh, top line. There, from there, we'll go to the front, and we're having a lot of problems with front assembly um, in the breed. Um, so the front assembly starts with prosternum. Prosternum is the breastbone. Uh, you need to have a pronounced prosternum. Uh, without a pronounced prosternum, then there's actually no place for shoulder lay back or or upper arm length and what have you. Actually, if you don't have a lot of prosternum or a good pronounced prosternum, um, that will directly affect uh, your, your shoulder. Um, so in other words, um, if the prosternum, if, if, if you look from the neck and you have a straight front with no prosternum, there's really no place for that, for, for you to have a good shoulder laid back or a good length of upper arm. If you have a nice pronounced prosternum where it's protruding, noticeably protruding um, in front of the neckline of the dog, um, then you'll have the ability to have good shoulder lay back and good length of upper arm. And we have a lot of straight fronts, you know, uh, a lot of straight fronts in the breed right now. And that's not good. Um, that affects directly affects movement because it affects your ability to reach. Uh, uh, the dog will actually prance more. Uh, even paddle on the front, um, rather than being able to have the, the, the good reach and extension um, that the Condi Corso um, should have. Uh, from there, we'll go to the rear. Uh, you know, although the front um, obviously, you know, um, supports a lot more weight, a lot more weight bearing um, than the rear is. Uh, but we'll go to the rear, and the uh, the Condi Corso is a, um, a moderately angulated uh, uh, dog. So. The rear starts with the pelvis, or the what we call pelvic tilt, or pelvic angle, or croup. Uh, you know, croup's basically the muscle mass over the over the pelvic bone. Again, there's nothing uh, breed specific there. It's 30 degrees, which is typical of most breeds. Uh, so we should have a, a slightly sloping croup. Um, the croup should be long, well muscled. Um, uh, the tail should be an extension of that back line. Uh, the upper thigh um, should be well muscled, uh, and the dog should have a moderate angulation. Um, basically, if you draw a straight line from the point of buttock, it should come straight down and hit, hit the toe. So you want to turn a stifle, but not excessive. 
uh, I am seeing um, straight rears, which don't have any turn of stifle, and I am seeing um, a lot of over-angulated rear dogs. We call that sickle hocked, where the where the the, the the rear has so much angulation that the feet are way behind the buttock, and that's a sickle hock dog. Typically, with sickle hocks, will also come a cow hock, uh, where the if you look from the rear, the, the feet are turned out, so so that's not good um, either. So you want a moderately angulated uh, rear. The um, the length of the of the hock um, is moderate. Um, it shouldn't be let way down like on a purely herding breed, and it shouldn't be really high either. It should be moderate. And again, the Connie Corso um, was a multifunctional dog. It was strictly a herding dog. Then a low hock set is more uh, would be more of what you would want on a, on a herding dog. And a really high hock set would be more of what you would want on strictly a catch dog because the dog's more stable. But um, you know, being a versatile, versatile working breed, um, just a moderate uh, hock length uh, is what you'd want to see. And uh, and again, moderate rear angulation. So when all this comes together in in movement, uh, the, the movement of a Connie Corsa for a, a dog its size with its substance and its mass is really beautiful on a correct dog. Um, uh, the correct uh, movement for a county course is what we call an um, extended trot or an elongated trot. Um, and basically what we look for uh, in a correct moving dog, if it's well structured and is moving correctly, you're going to see big open triangles. In other words, the you have a big triangle on the front feet when it's moving and a big triangle also on the back feet when it's moving. Uh, and the... Um, it will it will appear that the uh, front and rear toes are just slightly passing one another and the dog will have a period of, of uh, suspension where all four feet are actually off the ground for a split second uh, and that's and that should be effortless the standard says near single track i don't think a connie i know a connie course can't single track she never single track um the more common terminology um, used uh, for similar breeds is uh uh, somewhere is, isn't really a near single track, but it will converge to a common center line. So in other words, the feet start out here and they start coming in more together as a dog accelerates. Also, all the feet should remain straight uh, in a straight line. Uh, again, we don't want to see, um, you know, the rear hocks, cow hocking um, uh, or barrel hocking, you know, in the front, we don't want to see paddling. Uh, we definitely don't want to see east-west in the front or crossing over in the front when the dog's coming back to us, you know, uh, although they should converge um, towards a common center line. They should never cross over. So that's, uh, you know, the structure um, and movement is very important in the Connie Corso. Uh, it's a true working breed and needs to remain a true working breed. So structure and movement's extreme importance. Okay. What are your thoughts on coat colors? and markings and how much weight do they carry in the judging process? So we have um, colors for the Connie course that we've uh, always had. And it's, it's really not, um, you know, a whole lot of colors. We have black, we have gray, uh, and we have uh, fawn. The fawn is probably where you see the most um, variance. Of course, we have brindling. Now we have brindling of all those colors, um, but the fawns can be um, anywhere from what we call red, which is really still a fawn. It's a very, very rich fawn. Uh, we call it a red, uh, all the way to what we call a, uh, a formentino. Uh, formentino is basically a blue fawn. It's a blue-based dog, uh, and the uh, and the fawn uh, and the red is a black-based fawn. So that's where we'll see the most variance probably is in, in, in the fawns. Um, the, um, as far as weight, as long as it's a correct color, then it has no weight. No, nothing's preferred, you know. Um, you know. It doesn't matter if it's black, if it's gray, if it's, you know, we have different shades of gray. You know, we, you know, years ago it was referred to as slate gray or what have you for the really dark gray. And, um, even lilac for the lighter gray or, or what have you, but it's still gray. It's just different, di different shades of gray. Um, and we do have chestnut brindles also. Um, you know, it's, I think it's kind of, uh, it's kind of funny that in AKC, you can register 
a county course so chestnut brand on anybody that's filled out a county course or registration slip knows that there's a every color has a code and there's a code for chestnut brandle so you can register um a county course of chestnut brandle um but you uh it's not in the standard it doesn't say chestnut brandle thankfully it's close enough to brandle where I, I don't think anybody's ever challenged it or what have you but if you can register a county course of chestnut brandle and it is a traditional color you should should be written in the standard unfortunately it's not right now so hopefully that won't be any any controversy anytime soon but it's always that possibility um, another aspect uh, of color that's not 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 described enough is um uh, it, again in the fonts that's why i said the fonts probably have the most diversity um is um uh, is carbon we call it carbon it's a breed specific term kind of like you know, Formatino is a breed specific term for blue fawn. I mean, that's all Formatino is a blue fawn. But we call carbon where you'll have that 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 fringing or that dusting of the black tipping, you know, on the coat to, uh, to different degrees. Some are real heavy, some are real light. Um, some puppies have it, then it goes away, what, what have you. But it still remains a lot of adults. Uh, the AKC term for that would be called sable. Um, when you see that, uh, you know, a, a fawn with that it's sable. So I've been asked that a lot actually over the years by judges, you know, is it considered a dirty coat in our breed? And, um, you know, I say it's not a dirty coat, it's a traditional coat. Um, you'll see it again, very, very commonly to different degrees, but it should never be extreme or, or, or overbearing or overpowering, you know, um, but to have um, some degree of sabling is perfectly normal. So again, um, all those things, um, should never bear into, you know, in, in, into anything that has to do with uh, placements. You know, the only uh, fault uh, we have in color listed, which is actually a DQ, is black and tan. Uh, and it's black and tan points, black and tan pattern, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's uh, you know, obviously a Rottweiler, Doberman, other breeds. Uh, you know that's a you know that's that's a common color for them or actually the only color for say a rottweiler is black and tan points so we uh we have that as a uh as a dq and i'll share a little history on that for those of people that don't know um you know way back when uh, yeah way, way, way back when the um the black and tan was actually written into the original american standard uh, the michael satilli standard uh, included uh, black and tan and blue and tan because you know, we had the diluted also, which is blue and tan. Um, we had that written into the standard. Um, and uh, and the reason being was because there was a lot of Rottweiler mixing that occurred, you know, with the original Corsos here in the country. Um, so the um, black and tan was actually removed from the uh, original American standard in 2000. And then um, in 2008, right before the breed went into, or 2009, right before the breed went into AKC, it was made a DQ for the uh, for the obvious reasons, uh, because the origins of the uh, you know the black and tan, uh, black and tan's never been a fault or a DQ in the Italian standard because it's never been um, as problematic as it has been here, and unfortunately it continues to be problematic, but it, it comes from the uh, the Rottweiler influence, so. That's uh that's the only thing that you know obviously it's a DQ so the dog is out of the ring. Um, again with the fawns, there's another color um, that we have a breed specific term for also, and uh, uh, we call it straw. So a straw isn't a fawn. It's actually a different uh, DNA. If you DNA the dog, it would be a different color locus allele that produces uh, the straw. Um, some people say it's white, a white corso, but it's really not white. It's not a white uh, locus atlet. Um, it did exist historically, but but very very rarely uh, was it seen um, in the rustic Italian dogs. I actually asked some of the old Italians about it. Um, and I actually had the privilege of of, of meeting Stefano Gandolfi and uh, Fernando Casolino. Uh, while Fernando Castellino was, was still alive, I actually visited him in his home in Bologna uh, when he was 95 years old. And I asked a lot of questions. That was one of the questions that I'd asked. And basically, um, there was already already established colors that were common colors, the ones that we have today. 
Um, and that was very rarely seen, so it, there wasn't any reason to uh, basically to include it. Um, but it is historical. Um, there's no real other influence that causes the straw, but it's not a correct color. It's not a listed color. That would be something um, that I would fault. Uh, a lot of judges probably wouldn't, that aren't real familiar with the breed, uh, might not recognize it, might not fault it at all. Um, but I would definitely fault it because it's not a listed color. Uh, we see a lot of designer colors now. Fortunately, I haven't seen any in the ring, but I'm seeing, you know, Merle and Harlequin and Gani Corsos being advertised. People just trying to make money. That's, you know, obviously that's Great Dane influence, you know, something that crazy came in the ring. Even though it's not listed as a DQ, um, I would excuse a dog for lack of merit. because It's so far from the standard. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the other aspect of color is white. You know, um, you know, we can have white on the chest. We can have white on the toes. We can have white on the back of the pasterns. Um, we don't, um, the AKC standard doesn't allow white on the bridge of the muzzle. The Italian standard does, uh, you know, so uh, depending on where the white is and how much white's, you know, on a dog in front of me, that could be, um, you know, a deviation from the standard. Any deviation from the standard is a fault. Even if it's not a listed fault, it's a fault. So it should be penalized, uh, you know, accordingly. Uh, so that's um, that's it on color. Unless there's any other any other questions you have on color. No, you uh, actually covered it thoroughly, very thoroughly, more than I would thought. I learned a lot just then. <laughs> so um, let me go to the next. Well, good. Are there any specific health concerns or issues that judges should be aware of when evaluating a Connie Corso? Well, you know, as far as health issues and a judge evaluating a Connie Corso. Um, there's very, if a dog has a bad heart, I can't tell. Okay. So most health issues, you're probably not going to be able to notice with the exception of one. Uh, and that's temperament. Um, I always say temperament is mental health, right? Um, if, if, um, if I've got a dog in front of me, that's extremely skittish, scared to death, doesn't want to be touched. Um, then obviously I'll see that, uh, and that's um, that's not a good thing, you know. Especially not a good thing for a large, powerful breed like a county course. So county course should always be confident. So that's something I could see as far as health. You know, if a dog has some elbow displays here or some hip displays here, then of course you know um, that'll show in the movement to a degree. Um, probably won't move the best. Um, I still can't diagnose it as being hip displays or elbow displays here. I'll just you know basically look at it as poor movement for whatever reason. Um, now, if a dog is noticeably lame uh, in the ring, if I say it had severe dysplasia, it was noticeably lame, then any noticeably lame dog is excused from the ring. Uh, can't go on. So if, if I got a dog that has a catch in the front, uh, you know, um, you know, it has a limp in the back, what have you, the gate's not clean, you know, it's obviously has some, some issues going on that I can excuse that dog and dog should be excused. For, for being lame, but there's very little you can really tell um, by health other than, again, um, temperament. And um, um, unfortunately, um, it's not listed as a fault, you know, um, it should be. Um, there are other similar breeds. I'll give you two examples, the uh, uh, Doberman Pinscher, uh, the Doberman and the Rottweiler. Uh, on their temperament sessions and their breed standards, both uh, are crystal clear that um, uh, if a dog uh, is shy, any shy dog should be excused from the ring. That's a fault. It's a fault. Uh, our standard doesn't say that. I firmly believe it should. Um, uh, I won't excuse a dog unless it's extremely shy, but I certainly won't consider it for placement either. You know. Uh, so I wish our standard said that it doesn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I judge, one of the things that I do um, is when the, uh, at the end of, of course, I would examine the dog um, and stood for exam. That's great. You know, uh, I move it back and forth when it's done moving back and forth. When I'm looking at the dog, uh, when it comes back, when it's free stacked, I'll actually circle the dog. I'll walk from the front of the dog completely around the back of the dog. Uh, and I want to see, you know, how much, confidence that dog has. Is that dog turning its body? Is it turning its head? 
Is it, is it watching me scared about what I'm going to do? You know, so that, that plays into part of my um, evaluation of that dog as far as, uh, as far as temperament, despite not having a whole lot in the standard to, uh, you know, to rely on. Right. Okay. Are there any specific training or handling techniques that you believe can enhance a Connie Corso's chances in a show ring? So the, uh, a good handler, um, good handling goes hand in hand in being successful in the ring. Um, it, it's kind of like um, a race car. You know, if you've got a really good car, you have a really good driver, uh, your chances of winning are, are, are definitely better than uh, a good car with a poor driver or, or a great driver with a, you know, with a poor car or a slower car, right? So um, it, it's definitely important to have, have good handling on the dog, to show the dog its full potential. You know, if you don't move the dog properly, um, then, then the judge might not really see how well that dog moves. You know, um, same thing when you set the dog up. If you don't set the dog up properly, you could break the back line. The dog might have a great back line, but if you don't set the feet properly, then you could break the back line. It looks like the dog has a bad back line, but really it doesn't, you know. So um, there, there's lots of techniques and training and things that go into presenting a dog to its full potential. So basically, um, as far as presenting a dog to its full potential in the show ring, um, there's lots of great professional handlers that are experienced at training that dog to show its, to its best potential in the ring. Uh, for those of you that want to show your own dog, and I encourage that, I show my own dog, I've shown my own dogs over the years. I've also used professional handlers, it just depends on, you know, on the circumstances of that time. Um, but for those of you that want to show your own dog, you want to get into showing your own dog, um, I, I recommend first watching how dogs are presented of your, you know, of your breed of the county Corso. You know, go to the AKC shows, watch how they're presented, uh, and then um, find a local kennel club. Uh, most local kennel clubs will have handling classes, um, which typically have some judges involved and handlers involved and, and what have you. You can go to the handling classes. You can learn uh, to show your dog in the handling classes. And then also um, do some of the UKC shows. Uh, UKC is a great venue. Uh, there are no professional handlers allowed in, uh, in UKC. So it's a more laid back, relaxed, not quite as competitive uh, as an atmosphere, but everything's the same as far as the ring procedures, the movement, the presentation. Uh, the whole thing is, is basically the same as AKC, but it's um, kind of like minor league and major, major leagues, right? We, you know, we can kind of look at it that way. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, when you're ready, you feel you're, you're confident and you can step into the, uh, the AKC ring. Um, but there's, um, there's a lot more um, to presenting a dog to its full potential than just having a great dog and walking in the ring. You know, um, whatever car won the last uh, Indy 500, if me or you jumped behind the wheel, you know, no telling what would happen. We probably wouldn't make it a lap without wrecking, right? Um, so you could have a great dog or a great race car, but you also have to have a, a good driver or a good good handler or good handling to present it to its fullest potential. Okay. Can you describe the typical pace of judging in a Connie Corso show, including any specific routines or procedures that judges follow? So as far as pace, um, we're, we're, we're on a strict schedule. Um, we should uh, basically spend no more than two minutes per dog. Uh, and initially that doesn't sound like a whole lot of time, but in reality, it's plenty of time if you have a good eye for, for judging, okay? Uh, I've never taken more than, than two minutes a dog. Um, you know, in AKC or, or prior to that, um, you know, judging on, on the rare breed circuits when I uh, would judge the Arasachi shows or, what have you. So um, basically the pace or the time is about two minutes um, per dog. Um, but again, that's why the handler is important. The handling the presentation is important. You know, you know, you don't have a whole lot of time to fix things if they're not quite right. Right. So as far as procedure, ring procedure is pretty typical for all judges, although you're allowed whatever ring procedure you want to use. Basically, you have to do a an examination, a breed specific exam, examination of the dog being static or you know, it's stacked per se. 
Um, you know, ours uh, includes a full uh, dentition exam. Where we have to open the mouth, count all the teeth because we have a, the AKC has a, a DQ for more than two missing teeth. So we actually have to you know, thoroughly count all the teeth. We have to count the incisors, the premolars and the molars and the canines, of course, and be sure we have no more than two missing teeth. So the oral exam is important. Every, you know, every judge is supposed to do a thorough oral exam and count the teeth on a conic or so. Uh, from there, um, you know, examining the, the structure of the dog's pretty, pretty straightforward on a, on a corso. You really don't have to touch a corso um, like you would um, a heavy coated breed, like a black Russian terrier uh, or something of that nature, a giant schnauzer. You know, they have a lot of coat. So to find the point of shoulder, point of withers, the point of elbow, a lot of that stuff, you have to put your hands, dig into the coat, you know, to find those things. You know, I, I can judge structure and of course without ever touching it although i do touch the dog again uh, because i want to see the um, confidence of the dog and stability of that dog make sure it's not skittish or shy or reserved because it shouldn't be it's really the only reason i touch a corso um, of course there's a testicle you're supposed to touch the testicles to be sure they're you know they're they're there and they're real <laughs> so uh but um uh, from there um you know you move the dog you want to be able to uh to judge the movement um from a side gate, you want to see the side gate. You want to see uh, the dog moving away from you. You know, you look at the rear of the dog and you want to see the dog moving towards you. You look at the front of the dog. So the, that's pretty much it um, as far as the, uh, you know, the exam and the ring and the procedure. Um, typically the, um, you know, the static procedure where the dog stack will come first and the judge will ask you to, to move the dog, um, you know, down and back to see the front and rear and then in a circle to see the side gate. Can you explain the steps or requirements for someone who wishes to start their showing their dogs, particularly the Connie Corso breed? Yes, I um, pretty much covered that, um, you know, as far as the when we talk about the training or the handlers or what have you. Again, same thing, you know, if you want to show your own dog. Um, and a confirmation you know, class. Is, and that's um, great. I'm all for that. If you want to show your own dog, that's great. Find a local kennel club. Uh, all of that handling classes um, start out in some UKC, try to find some UKC shows. Uh, of course, watch the AKC uh, show very, very, be very, very attentive. Pay a lot of attention to what's going on in that ring uh, when you watch um, the handling. What advice would you give to the breeders looking to improve the Connie Corso breed or ones who participate in dog shows? So, Participating in a dog show in itself is supposed to be the whole aspect of it is to prove your breeding stock as being being worthy. Um, so what we can determine in the show ring is confirmation. Does the dog meet the breed standard? Does the dog have sound structure and movement to function properly? Uh, as we said, we can't tell a whole lot about health, um, you know, other than temperament. Uh, temperaments of extreme importance. It's mental health. Um, again, I wish there was more emphasis put on, you know, in our breed standard on temperament, you know, in the show ring. Um, you know, a dog that, that's shy should never be rewarded whatsoever, should be excused. Um, but um, uh, that's about it for the show ring is, is the confirmation aspect of, you know, of the dog. As far as breeding, um, you know, we could probably do another episode on that, but I'll, I'll just touch briefly on it. Um, you want, uh, again, um, a healthy dog, mental health, which is temperament. So temperamentally sound dogs should only be used for reproduction. Um, dogs that, uh, um, you know, have um, good hips, good elbows, um, dysplasia uh, are two concerns with any large breed. Um, you know, the other um, health requirements that we have in the OFA Right now for the county Corso is heart, which is important, although we don't have a lot of heart issues, thankfully. Uh, patellas, which I really don't know why we have patellas. We don't have a lot of patella problems. We have a lot of ACL problems, but there's, right now there's no way to screen for that, uh, the knowledge of your lines. We have way more torn ACLs than we have um, you know, um, loose patellas. Uh, but, but in any event, patella is more of a small dog problem than is a large breed problem. Uh, but another um, very, very important um, health screen, and I'm thankful that we finally have health screening for it, is DSRA. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, 
um, you know, we were having dogs with DSRA, but we didn't know what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't identified. We didn't know what to call it. Uh, the most common um, sign or symptom was translucent or clear teeth. Um, there were other things that would go along with that sometimes, um, very weak bones. A lot of us thought it was probably some type of calcium deficiency or something of that nature, but it wasn't identified. But in recent years, they've identified it as DSRA. It is breed specific. It's really the only breed specific um, disease I know of for, for the Connie Corso. And the other things I talked about, heart, hips, elbows, that's shared, you know, you know, you know amongst breeds. But DSRA is, is Connie Corso specific. Um, it's uh, a lot of the dogs don't don't survive it. They have to be put down. They lose all their teeth. Their bones shatter. Um, it's, it's, it's very devastating. Um, and it's, and right now it's a simple 50 to hundred dollar test. Uh, you take a, uh, you take a Q-tip swab, swab the inside of the gum, mail it in. And, uh, from that, from that DNA, they can determine whether the, the dog, um, is a carrier or a non-carrier like anything else. Um, you, know, you can still use a carrier if it's a really great dog, um, in your program, you just can never will produce the problem. Um, ideally, you don't want to use uh, any carriers, you know. um, but DSRA, um, uh, it's a great thing. Glad that we finally identified it. Like I said, you know, years ago, you know, for years, you know, we, you know, we, we would know about it. We'd see it, but there was no name for it. We had no idea what it was, how to prevent it, what have you, you know, so that's a great thing. So health testing is important. And, and again, um, it's not just hips, elbows, DSRA, whatever. It's also mental health. Um, just temperament, you know, um, anything that doesn't, that doesn't meet um, uh, a high level of health standards should never be used for reproduction. Uh, it's, um, isn't worth it. You know, you can uh, spay and neuter that dog and, you know, find it at home and move on to something right. uh, for reproduction that doesn't have any of those issues. All right. Um, how do you stay up to date on the latest breed standards, rule changes, and trends in the dog show world? So, you know, as a, um, as a judge and, and, and also as anyone that would be, you know, active in confirmation, but especially as a judge, um, the judges receive um, emails on a regular basis with anything that's changed as far as uh, ring procedures, uh, what have you. Uh, same thing for breed standards. If there's any standard revisions, then... Uh, um, then you receive uh, the revised uh, breed standard. Uh, the Connie Corso standard um, has remained uh, unchanged since it went into AKC in 2010. Although uh, myself, I had started uh, working on breed standard revisions when I was uh, the breed education judge's education coordinator uh, for the parent club uh, 2015 to 2019. So we initiated some some breed standard revisions. The, the Corso standard does need some breed standard revisions. Like one of the things I just just mentioned earlier was we have nothing in there for temperament. You know, our temperament section basically says the um, the breed is um, loving um, and affectionate with family and what have you. Well, you know, if, if the if the dog's in the ring being judged, I have no idea if it's affectionate with its family or not. You know, uh, there's nothing of of any any substance of any importance in the temperament part of the breed standard right now. Uh, but, uh, but again, um, the AKC Gazette, uh, for those of you that aren't judges, the AKC Gazette comes out um, every month and the secretary's pages has any, anything that's, that's changed as far as rules for, sh for shows, for agility, for anything that AKC offers, all that will be in the secretary pages in the AKC Gazette. The AKC Gazette is an online magazine. It also has some good articles in it, you know. So you can go to the AKC website, go to the Gazette, and um, and, and I think a lot of people actually get that, um, uh, or at least a link emailed to me every month when that that comes out. So that's that's a good resource okay. to stay up to date. Cool. All right, I got one more for you. So, what are your thoughts on the current AKC standards yep. and the proposed revisions? So. The, the current AKC breed standard was, um, uh, it, it lacks a lot of important information and has a lot of information in it that's 
not of any importance. Um, for instance, the current standard is redundant on color in a lot of areas. Um, it goes into extreme detail on color for the eyes. That's been very problematic, of course, of eye in our grays, um, in our Formatinos, uh, can be a very uh, light yellowish color. So when I did judges education, I always told them don't don't get stuck on the yellow bird prey IDQ so much on the yellow aspect as on the bird prey aspect was that little bitty black pupil in the center, you know. Um, but that should never have been made a DQ. Uh, it's very confusing. And and the other flip side of that is um, um, because um, a judge might not be quite sure. Uh, same thing happens with another DQ that we have, uh, which is undershot more than a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch isn't much. It's very little. So on one hand, we're saying that uh, a slight undershot or level bite um, is, uh, is preferred. It's the preferred bite with the scissor being acceptable. Um, but if it's undershot, any more than a quarter of an inch, it's a DQ. You're out of the ring, you're DQ. Three DQs, you can never show again. So that should never have been made a, a, a DQ. Extreme undershot, uh, I think it should be a fault. Overshot should be a fault, right? Um, so again, um, there's no way to measure it. It's still subjective. Although it's based on a measurement, uh, there's no way to measure that. There's no bite wicket, you know. Uh, breeds that have uh, DQs for, for height, um, if there's a question as far as height, you get the wicket out. It either measures or it doesn't, um, but there's no way to measure that, that quarter of an inch. And it's, you know, it's, it's so minute, a quarter of an inch is, to, you know, on one hand to say that, you know, the, the undershot's um, preferred, but on the other hand, to say it's more than a quarter of an inch, you're out of the ring on a DQ. So that, that's a horrible DQ. The, um, and again, the other aspect of that isn't so much, um, well, it is, of course, but and we need more description in important areas. You know, like I said, we have all, I think we have like 40 something words in the standard right now pertaining to eye color. Um, but we have very little detail on coat color. We have a ton of words on the nail color matching blue or black on a, you know, on a, on a blue or black dog, uh, the nose pigment being black or blue. That goes without saying, right? But it's said again and again and again in our standard. Wasted words, wasted time. Um, the fawns, again, have, um, there's no real references to the fawns, you know, especially as far as the carbon or the sable should be the terminology used for that. So, again, I've had a lot of judges ask me, that's a dirty coat in our breed. It's not. So, again, you know, if you, are you at a disadvantage when you take a, a fawn dog in that has uh, some degree of uh, carbon or sable on there? It's possible because the standard doesn't address it really one way or another. Um, the, um, we have, uh, and I was, we talked earlier about details as, as far as, uh, breed expression, breed specific details and head type. And, uh, and I went into how the eyes are important. One of the most important aspects of expression and, uh, the current standard, again, I think it has like 40 words pertaining to eye color, um, and a multicolored breed with multicolored eyes. We've got 40 words to eye color, but yet we have no, uh, no description of proper eye set. None, none whatsoever. Nothing about proper eye set uh, in there, which is so important. Um, there's nothing in our breed standard right now as far as the Masetta region. You know, uh, I mean, basically, it, you know, there's, it should it should have good fill, not excessive fill or be cheeky, but it should never be shallow or hollow either. We should have a good Masetta region, uh, good fill. There's nothing in there about the Masetta region, so there's a lot of shortcomings um, um, to the region, you know, to the to the current uh, breed standard that, that should be addressed. Um, some of the revisions, um, again, I've already said temperament, but we definitely need something, uh, something more solid, something more applicable for temperament. Doberman has it, Rottweiler has it. We should be in line with those breeds. You know, we, sh we shouldn't allow uh, skittish, shy, unstable uh, dogs um, to ever be rewarded. They should be excused immediately. Done. You know, um, that should never be used for reproduction. It's a, it's a danger in the long, long run. Um, and probably, 
another revision that's been proposed recently by the current um, by the current uh, uh, board of the parent club and the uh, judge's education director um, is to change the way the dog is measured, um, which will actually change uh, the overall length of the dog. Um, basically, we we had spoken earlier about the three types of body construction and proportions. County courses are rectangular breeds, always been a rectangular breed. It's always been measured point of shoulder, point of buttock, 10% greater uh, uh, than, than, than height and length. Um, they want to change the way the dog is measured from uh, the point of shoulder, the point of buttock, to the prosternum, the point of buttock. So basically, when you do that, uh, whatever the difference is between prosternum and point of shoulder, which is usually one to two inches, uh, the more the better, actually, uh, because again, prosternum is, is is one of the key elements of a good front assembly. So whatever that difference is, one to two inches, how much you will actually shorten that dog. Um, an off square breed, say the Rottweiler, is actually measured prosternum to point of buttock, nine and ten, same measurement as the County Corso. But the Rottweiler's off square. The County Corso is rectangular. The County Corso is measured point of shoulder to point of buttock. Rottweiler pro sternum to point of buttock. Off square breed, rectangular breed. Now we're going to be measuring, if this passes, we'll be measuring the County Corso the same exact way as you measure a Rottweiler, which is an off square breed. So that's very dangerous. You know, you're, you're, audit, you're instantly going to make a correct dog now body length incorrect because it'll be too long. And you're going to make an incorrect dog right now that's off square. The more pro sternum it has, the more that dog's gonna be shortened in body length. So you have a really great front and now you're really penalizing the dog. So that's that's the difference that you're gonna shorten the dog in overall body length. And that uh, that proposal for a breed center revision should should be passed and, and put in put in place. And instantly it'll you know it'll change every dog, you know, uh, to be to have to be correct to uh, something that was never done before. Uh, there's no good reason for it. Uh, but uh, but unfortunately, that's a proposal. Mm. Well, okay. Well, Jimmy, that's all I got. Uh, man, I want to thank you for coming in, giving us all the guidance you have, clearing up some a lot of things people had questions on. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we get out of here? No, I, I appreciate you having me on. I'm always here to help anyone. Anybody ever wants to reach out to me, they're welcome to any questions or, or concerns or what have you. I'm, uh, I'm always here for the breed and everything I do is, is, you know, it's for the breed first and foremost. So I appreciate you having, uh, having me on and hopefully I can, uh, hopefully I can help, help others uh, understand things a little bit better. Yep. I think you have, I think you have. All right, man. Thank you, man. So much. All right. Take care. And that wraps up another episode of NWA Connie Corsos. Thank you for being a part of our Connie Corso community. Remember, you can stay connected with us beyond the podcast. Find us on all major media platforms by searching for NWA Connie Corsos. Whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, just hit that follow button to join the conversation and get the latest updates. If you have a burning question or want to apply to be a guest on our show, we'd love to hear from you. Simply shoot us an email at nwaconnycorsos at gmail.com. And if you're a business interested in becoming a sponsor, reach out to us at the same email address. For more resources, exclusive content, and links to all our social media profiles, visit our website at nwaconnycorsos.com. It's your go-to destination for everything dogs. Thank you once again for tuning in. And we can't wait to bring you more exciting episodes where we explore the fascinating world of dogs.